Hi, my name is Ashley, one of the educators here at the Living Coast Discovery Center. And today, we're getting a chance to learn about tide pooling and how you can actually go outside and go tide pooling. Now here in San Diego County, we are very lucky to have so many different diverse coastlines available for us to go outside and enjoy the beaches, tide pools, and any other rocky shorelines that we have up and down our coastline. One of the other unique things about San Diego County is that we actually have 11 different marine protected areas. Marine protected areas are safe spaces along our coastline that actually provide a safe space for the plants and the animals that call the ocean their home, as well as provide great opportunities for recreational usage. So these are great places to go out and kayak and swim and snorkel, as well as tide pooling. Now these MPAs or marine protected areas are actually going to be managed and maintained by a couple different organizations, including US Fish and Wildlife, different state park organizations, as well as many other organizations that are not necessarily affiliated with the government. So this joint program is what allows us to have this great biodiverse region around us on our coastline. Now today we're gonna go out and see what kind of animals we can find down in our tide pool. Now, before we go ahead and get started looking for animals and plants here in the tide pool, let's talk a little bit about where we are and what a tide pool is. Here, we are actually at Bird Rock. Bird Rock Beach is a location that is actually just a little bit north of Pacific Beach and a little bit south of La Jolla. Now, this area is a part of the La Jolla State Marine Protected Area, so it is still included in that MPA, and it is a protected space. So you can come out here to check out tide pools and just enjoy the nature and the wildlife around you. Now, tide pools are going to be pools of water that have been left behind as the tides come up onto the shorelines and pull back out. Tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, and generally we have four tides per day. This can vary a little bit, but generally we will have two high tides and two low tides. This means that twice a day, the tide will come up as high as it possibly can, flooding out the shoreline area, and then it'll pull back out or recede back out into the waterline. This creates the low tide. And as we get into the low tide, it actually leaves behind pools of water, as you can see all around me here. There are small pools of water that have been left behind in rocky crevices or sandy pockets, even just in between different spaces of rocks and other objects. Now here at Bird Rock, this is a unique tide zone as it is known as a rocky intertidal zone. And it is known as that because there are a large amount of hard rocks and substrates that will be found all up and down the coastline. Tide pooling is a great opportunity to get a chance to check out some of the amazing animals and plants that call the ocean home. Here at Bird Rock, we have the opportunity to get up close and personal with some of these unique creatures. But before you go ahead and get started, here are the best five tips to help you get started on your tide pooling journey. Number one, you wanna make sure you check the tide chart. It's really important to know when the tide is going to be at its lowest and at its highest. So as we discussed earlier, there are two high tides and two low tides in a day. The low tide is when you wanna go out tide pooling, as this means it's gonna be the farthest point for the day. Now today, low tide is actually at 2.45 p.m. at negative one and a half feet. So that means at 2.45 p.m., the tide will be the farthest back it is going to get for the while. Now this allows us to see farther into the rocky intertidal zone than what we would normally get a chance to check out. But it's also important to know when the high tide is so you can be aware of when to watch out for the tide coming back up behind you so you don't end up in the ocean. Now number two is dressing appropriately. There are a lot of different things that you need to consider when you're getting dressed to go tide pooling for the day. And one of that is that you are gonna be surrounded by water. So you wanna make sure whatever you're wearing is appropriate to get wet and can dry out. You also wanna make sure it's comfortable because you're gonna be bending down and moving around in a lot of different and awkward positions sometimes. So comfortable clothes are going to be best. So I'm wearing layers today to protect myself from both the sun and the wind. 
because those are two big factors to consider on the shoreline, as well as comfortable pants that allow me to be able to get in and out of the water and be okay. Now, the most important thing you need to remember for getting dressed for the day is what kind of shoes you're going to wear. You need to have shoes with great tread on them so that you won't slip and fall. The rocky shoreline is often covered in algae and can be very slippery in the tidal zone. So I'm wearing my diving boots, which is what I prefer to wear, but they're not necessary. You can also wear any type of athletic sandal that's designed to have good track and keep on your foot. So these are some Chacos, which are a great example of what you can wear, as well as Tevas or Keens. So don't worry if you don't have specialty shoes, you can still go out and even go out barefoot if that's what you decide to do. Just make sure you're being careful as it is very slippery. Now, third, you wanna make sure you take your time when you're out tide pooling. There are tons of different animals and plants that are inside of these tide pools and they're not always gonna be easy to see. You need to take your time and go slow. Come up on a pool and spend a few minutes checking it out, moving some algae around, just gently looking, making sure you don't move anything too fast because that will scare things away. And a lot of the time these animals are very fast as well. So you wanna make sure you do so slowly to allow them the opportunity to do what it is they're gonna do. And be patient while you're doing this, as it does take a lot of time to find all the fun different creatures that live in a tide pool. Now, building off of this is tip number four, to respect wildlife. Whenever you see any animals in the water or on the rocks or just really kind of running around on the shoreline, you wanna make sure that you are being respectful of them. Keep in mind, all of these animals are living and breathing creatures so we wanna treat them with care and respect. This is after all their home. So we wanna make sure we're doing our part to make sure that they are still comfortable. Now, some animals in the tide pool are okay to handle and you can pick certain animals up, but you wanna make sure you're paying attention to what it is you're trying to pick up. Not everything is handleable. Not everything can be out of the water. Many tide pool animals are designed to withstand the high periods of desiccation probability. So those periods of no water so they are able to withstand that. But that doesn't mean that if you just pick something up that it's gonna be ready to handle that. So you wanna make sure you're being careful and paying attention to the type of animal you're looking at. Now with that, there are some animals that have really strong muscles that they use to hold on to rocks. And if you touch something and kind of wiggle it and it doesn't come off easily, then you wanna make sure you leave that alone. You wanna make sure you're not prying or just ripping anything off the wall because that can actually hurt the animals. And that's the last thing we wanna do. Now, with your animal friends that you haven't had a chance to pick up, you also want to make sure you put them back in the same spot. So you don't want to put them back somewhere else. You want to put them back as close to the same spot as you got them from. Now, last but not least is going to be rule number five, which is going to be don't take. We don't want to take anything we find in a tide pool. This goes for both living animals or plants, as well as things like the rocks and the shells or any other cool objects we find because all of these different parts are a part of this ecosystem and they are important for the animals that call tide pools home. So even if you don't think it's something that you would consider useful for an animal, it could be used for another purpose. So it's all going to be part of that natural process. And we wanna make sure we leave everything in the tide pool here, everything that's natural anyway. If you find some trash or human other objects, you, you can take that, that's totally okay. <laughs> Let's start in the high intertidal zone. The high intertidal zone characteristically has the least amount of water coming into it. This area generally only gets water during the highest part of high tide. So at that maximum level of high tide, will this area see a lot of water. This area tends to have a lot of rocks or large boulders if you're in a rocky intertidal zone, like here at Bird Rock. Animals that can survive here are things like barnacles, different types of snails, shore crabs, and hermit crabs. Now an animal that is most commonly found in the high intertidal is a shore crab. To pick them up, they're often hiding in crevices. So you wanna use a two finger scoop, being careful to place a finger over the carapace and then give them a home. Always try and keep the crab from walking off of your hand. Once they get comfortable, they will allow you to be able to open your hand up so you can get a good look at your shore crab. Now, one thing to keep in mind is shore crabs do have chelipeds or pinchers, so you wanna make sure you're being aware of where those are at to avoid getting pinched. Once you've got a good look at your crab, you can go ahead and put your hand down on the ground and just gently scoot your crab back off so it can go back to the tide pool. 
Now let's take a moment and check out what's in the middle intertidal zone. The middle intertidal zone is actually going to be the most diverse region of a tidal zone. This area has water coming in and out of it throughout the day. So it gets flooded twice a day, as well as has those periods of no water for twice a day as well. This allows a higher diversity of animals and plants that are going to be able to survive in this zone. Many different things live here, including things like sea stars, anemones, crabs, snails, different types of worms and polychaetes, even bigger animals like fish, octopus, and sometimes even eels. Now, other things that you can find here is, include things like plants. We often forget to include our plants when we're tide pooling, but we have many different species of algae, including the red algae, green algae, and brown algae, plus things like eelgrass and sea lettuce. All of these organisms are important in our tide pool ecosystem as they provide food and shelter to all of the different animals. Another thing that this zone is really good for is actually providing a nursery space. You wouldn't necessarily think that these little pockets would be a good nursery zone as they do sometimes dry out, but they provide a protected space for many different organisms like fish and octopus who lay eggs because it is harder for predators to be able to come in and access some of these areas. Green sea anemones are a cool animal to get a chance to touch in the tidal zone. Anemones are surrounded by tentacles or nematocysts, which are stinging cells. But don't worry, they're perfectly safe for you to touch. The nematocysts are too small to hurt our human skin. So what you wanna do is take a finger and slowly reach into the edges of the tentacles and just give it a gentle touch on the edge. The anemone will actually start to close around you because it thinks you're its food source. When you're all done, just gently pull your finger back out and allow the anemone to stay where it is. Let's check out the low intertidal zone. The low intertidal zone is going to be the area of the tide pool that is usually underwater, and it is only exposed at the lowest part of low tide, which for us is right now. If you plan your trip right by checking those tide charts, you can make sure that you can come out and see the lowest part of the tide pool zones. Now, we have a negative one and a half foot tide today, which means we have a huge area that is normally underwater that is exposed. This area is one of the most abundant zones in the intertidal zone. Because of how often it's covered in water, it provides a lot more opportunity for different organisms to be able to survive. Different animals that live in the low intertidal zone are going to be things like abalone, limpets, mussels, different types of crabs, various types of fish like sculpin, as well as different animals like nudibranchs or sea cucumbers. There can even be things like eels that have been stranded in one of these lower tide pools. So there's a wide variety of different animals that you can get a chance to check out when you come out during the lowest part of low tide. Here we have a bat star, one of the most common species of sea star you will find in San Diego tide pools. Bat stars get their name because they have webbing in between their arms. In order to pick one up, you wanna gently scoop it into your hand, trying your best to keep it underwater at all times. Sea stars have two feet underneath and that's what they use to hold on to the rocks. So gently lifting them to allow them to release. Now this sea star is missing two tips of its arms. Sea stars have the unique ability to regenerate or regrow their arms if they are lost due to predation. So this sea star may regrow those in the future as well as potentially up to two out of that same spot. Now, you can also flip over your sea star to get a chance to check out those two feet up close as well as their mouth. Once you're done, you do wanna flip it back over to its upright position and very gently place it back down into the pool. Remember, try to keep it underwater at all times while picking up a sea star. Tide pools provide great opportunities for you to be able to check out our oceans and what lives beneath them. Now that we've had a chance to learn about tide pools, hopefully you feel like you are better prepared to go out and explore the natural area around you. Here in San Diego, we have so many different opportunities for you to go tide pooling, including places like Cabrillo National Monument, Ocean Beach, La Jolla, 
and even Silver Strand State Beach, you have so many different opportunities to go tide pooling throughout San Diego County. Just remember those five tips we talked about at the beginning and you will have a great time. Now, the last thing I wanna leave you with is a saying that I like to keep in mind whenever I go out in nature, but especially when I go out to tide pools. Take only pictures, leave only footprints. Now this saying is meant to mean that when you go out in natural areas, you wanna make sure you only take pictures and the memories and leave everything else where it is. Anything you find, you wanna make sure you leave it behind. And you wanna make sure that you don't leave any of your own personal stuff behind in the natural area. So if you brought in, say, some snack wrappers or you had a plastic water bottle or you dropped your sunglasses, you wanna make sure you take any of your human man-made products back out with you so you're not leaving anything behind other than your footprints.